Good to see you all. Some new faces today, some returning. Hello, we have a few more people that will should be joining us in just a second here, but why don't we all get started? Welcome to Preparing Box St. John Passion. This is exciting, kind of a little bit different than the past few sessions have been. Um, but the same, the same few rules, I'll go over them. Well, not rules, guidelines. Uh, I'll go over these before we get started. And then I'm going to pass the mic to Harold. So just as before, there will be a live Q&A at the end of the session that's open to everyone. Um, but we are going to be taking questions as we go through um, this wonderful piece. So to show you the most streamlined way to um, mention to Harold that you have a question, I am going to show you a fun little um, Zoom, Zoom technique. And it is as follows. Now, since I'm the host of this meeting, it's gonna look a little differently. But if you have a question, you can go to the participants, which will be at the bottom of your screen and click the down or up carrot. Once you get participants, instead of more on this bottom right corner, you'll see three dots. You press the three dots and it will say, raise your hand. And that will signify to us that you have a question. And we can do it that way. Now, if that doesn't work on your computer or there's any issues, we can do it the old fashioned way. You can mute, unmute yourself and you can ask Carol if you can ask a question. Now, for, um, of course, we'll have time at the end to have any questions that you have in general about preparing a score, about um, St. Pas uh, John's Passion and or anything you haven't thought of as we go through the session today. So if you have a question at the end, that is also acceptable. Since there are so many of us, we have put everyone on mute to avoid extra feedback or background noise. To unmute yourself and communicate with Harold during these sessions, you can hold down the space bar to unmute yourself when you're talking. Releasing the space bar will mute yourself again automatically. If this doesn't work, you can always use the microphone button that's on the bottom left part of your screen. We'll be sending over more information about the organization and Harold to the chat box, which includes a donation link. Harold is giving all of these sessions to the public for free. And so any and all donations are greatly accepted. These donations go to Canticorum Virtuosi Inc., which provides all of the funding for both of Harold's New York based choirs. And these donations are tax deductible. So please use this chat box as well as the email that we've been communicating with you um, to request any technological assistance. And lastly, we'll be recording this video like we do for every session and sending it out to you after today's event is over. So um, you can use that to keep in your records and go back to at any point. And that being said, I will turn over the mic to Harold and we'll get started. Hi everybody, can you all hear me? Okay, great. We had 13 people signed up but I don't see 13 yet. Maybe some people will come in late. Um, yeah, tonight's going to be a little different. Instead of uh, participants, active participants, as opposed to viewers, um, you'll all be viewers um, because I have so much to say. I'll just be talking. And uh, as I'm talking, you will be seeing the music that I'm talking about, page by page, measure by measure. Uh, but let me just say a word about this piece. I've conducted it five times in my life. I just asked my wife and she, confer, she confer, confirms with me that I haven't done it in at least 10 years, but um, I've done it uh, with orchestra every time and Alice Tully Hall and the Cathedral of St. John the Divine uh, and other places. And to me, it's the most dramatic sacred work ever written. I mean, one can argue, one can come up with 50 other pieces that are dramatic sacred works, but this one speaks to me and crushes me more than any other. It's just so powerful and concise. I mean, I've done the St. Matthew Passion a few times. Uh, the the um, St. John, I think is about an hour and a half long, I forget, but the St. Matthew is three hours and 20 minutes. So it's more drawn out. And uh, in that sense, you might say, well, you have three hours and 20 minutes of bliss and here it's only, only an hour and a half, but it's so action packed, it's unbelievable. Now, um, what I wanna do is focus on two things besides taking a sip of water. 
<clears throat> Sorry. And um, and one is to give an overview from a conductor's point of view. So I'll actually be demonstrating some conducting moves that I'll discuss as we move through the piece. And the other one is just analyzing the piece for performance. Now, to those of you who who have never worked with me, I'll say without a doubt that in all the years I've been conducting, I've never gone to the first rehearsal before singing through every single line, singing through the soprano part, the alto part, the tenor part, and making markings, little crescendos, accents, tenutos, little, a tenuto, by the way, <clears throat> the way professional singers in New York City view and understand a, a horizontal line above or beneath a note is that it's simply a slight accent. It's a slight accent. So um, in this piece, you have tenutos, but you also have real, real accents, sideways B. So I'll be talking about, um, you know, how, how to go from note to note and section to section uh, in terms of performing it, in terms of singing it, and, and ideas that a conductor wants to convey, but also I'll be demonstrating physical technique. Um, I've often, oh, you can look at the first page now, um, Karina, if you can get that up there. This is on CPDL. It's not the version I have. Um, that's a bright Brightcorp edition. I'm looking at a Calmus <laughs> miniature score. Uh, it's very small when I have, a very small print, but I have a lot of light, I have my glasses on, and I, and I have the translation in the score, which is one of the reasons I'm using this particular one here. Um, there are no measure, yes, there are no measure markings in my score, but I actually wrote them in many years ago, so it'll confer to what you're looking at. Okay, the opening. <clears throat> um, we won't talk about the orchestration or performance practices. Well, let's just talk, delve right into the piece itself. I actually have a note in my score. I don't know if you can see it, but I have um, not too slow with an exclamation point at the beginning. I don't know if you can see it. That's for me <laughs> in blue. And uh, when one comes to perform a piece, I always tell people, don't just jump right in, just stand there and concentrate and get the right tempo because that's really important. If you look at videos on YouTube of Leonard Bernstein, he always just stands there and waits and thinks of the music, you know? So here we go. So all you need, cause it's really sort of andante is a fourth beat, a fourth beat prep. Okay. Um, this goes on and on for quite a while. Uh, yeah, go down until the chorus comes in. It's 18 measures before the chorus comes in. Go back a little bit, Karina. And, you know, I, when I'm conducting this and, you know, I, 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 even on stage while I'm conducting it, I, I often think like, what can I actually do besides keeping the bead and cueing the oboes and the flutes? Now, you know, professional players, they don't really need cues, I mean, in, in music like this. But <clears throat> again, throughout my long career, I've been told by players that they really appreciate the cues I give. I mean, you can think of it, their mind can wander, you know, what any, anybody's mind can wander, but if you give cues, they, they feel confident. But there's nothing much to do here. So I think to myself, you know, is there anything to bring out? Can you get a little louder at places? Well, <clears throat> yes, there are places wh which, where the music can emerge a little bit, but the most, uh, the, the uh, thing I, that really strikes me, and there's no particular treatise that tells you to do this. It's just the way one conceives of it when one studies it. And measure 21, oh no, 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 sorry. Um, sorry, uh, this is <clears throat> just measure uh, 17, right before the chorus comes in, 17. Da, 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 a crescendo, a two measure crescendo, da, 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 a crescendo, two measure crescendo for everybody. Um, and, and maybe back in, back in measure nine, can we just go back to measure nine for a minute? You know, I have in my score crescendo in the first half of the measure. 
we're not he we're not all hearing this in our heads right now, but you know, I just feel a little bit of movement, movement. But um, you know, the music here is so harmonically varied and so beautiful and interesting that it just spins out on its own and you don't have to tamper with it. I, I can use that term um, because I feel like sometimes you just sit back and let, let the music spin out. Now, that's, that doesn't happen too often, but for, for this uh, sort of meandering or rather long introduction, it just seems to move ahead by itself. So, okay, so now the chorus comes in. <clears throat> and um, I have, uh, you know, the, I mean, the, t the translation I have in this particular score is not necessarily entirely accurate. That goes for any score, I guess. But these are the congregation of believers saying, Lord, our Redeemer, you know, um, thou who's taught me to see the, because the, thou whose name in all the world is ours. So it's just a, an introductory kind of piece. Now, um, so we all know, I hope you all know that all R's in German should be rolled when possible when you sing. So, and this gives you a real opportunity. I mean, I'm talking about all R's <laughs> if possible, even in the middle of words, it's not always possible, but here you have, and I phys physically, I cannot roll R's. There are two reasons why I'm not a great opera singer. I cannot roll R's and my voice sucks. Other than that, I could be a great opera singer. Anyway, um, hell, you know, and then you roll the R as you release it. That's a great opportunity to roll the R because there's nothing interfering with it. It's a rest. Um, he doesn't put very dyna many dynamic markings in ever. I mean, com Baroque composers just don't do that. But I mean, it is marked forte at the beginning, I believe. In my score, it's not, but my score is calmness. Can you go to the very beginning of the movement a minute, Karina? Uh, okay. So maybe it's mezzo piano. Actually, in my score, I have no, nothing. So I myself put, uh, uh, here it is. I put mezzo forte slash mezzo piano because you have to come up with dynamics on your own, you know? But then when there's that crescendo, go back to that crescendo right before the chorus comes in. Then I have a big forte mark. Hey, hey, hey. Now, um, as opposed to uh, string players, some of you I'm sure play in orchestras and have been, um, a, a string player wouldn't necessarily hold quarter notes, which are followed by rests for, for its full value. So um, if you want it for the full value, you have full value, you have to indicate that in the orchestral, in the, in the instrumental parts and also tell them, especially in moments where there's a very dramatic, like in a recitative uh, accompagnato, the voice of him, like in Handel's Messiah, vroom. The quiet in the wilderness, vroom. It's written, I believe, in a quarter note, but they never play it for full length. But you want the, cor the chorus to sing this full length, so you tell them that in rehearsal. Or you just say in general, if, uh, unless otherwise spoken, it's full length. Um, especially you have the double R here. Now, as I said, as I might have said, not today, but in past uh, lectures, I make it a point never to listen to anybody else's interpretation before, once I decide to do a piece, even if I've heard the piece, you know, on recordings or live, once I decide to do it, I just study it and come up with my own ideas. But recently, like this summer, actually, I was listening to a, a great recording of this. Now, my interpretation has always been three fortes, and I heard a, uh, an interpretation with each one was softer, and the third one was more supplicating, like this. Like a little bit like a, maybe a hairpin, or it just sounded like more breathy and, and just like defeated or like supplicating. It was br brilliant. Brilliant. Um, now let's go on. Uh, generally speaking, and I really mean generally speaking, before, um, after rests, um, people tend to sing like pickups too loudly. So they might go, unser Herr, instead of unser Herr, our Lord, 
instead of our Lord. So all these little details have to be thought out ahead of time and put in the music for the singers, whether they're professionals or amateurs. Um, so, um, you know, I can spend 45 minutes on this one movement, like when I explain what a fugue is to a music appreciation class, it takes me 45 minutes to explain fugue, but there are 60 something movements here, so we should move on. But what I have in my score is, um, hold on a second, I wanna put your pictures to the left of the score, is um, I have, I, oh, I see, I do have a, a like a decrescendo in measure 20, right. So that unza starts mezzo piano. And then I have a crescendo in 21, of, to, which lasts for two measures. So, so. And the orchestra gets soft. Two and three. Ah, then it's forte again, that kind of thing. Um, throughout this hour, I want to, you know, point out things that people do when they sing that that could be improved. For example, um, you you don't want your singers going back in measure twenty one when they first have sixteenth notes like the sopranos and deltos. It would be kind of boring and, and mechanical to go <laughs> I like them to think of you know four notes like this uh, having the first one accented a bit. One E and a two E and a three E and a ta -da 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 -da. So that's that's something I, to keep in mind. Another thing is um, whether to um, in mission twenty three should the eighth note before the quarter rest be full value, full value or, or an eighth or a, um, a staccato, you know? Um, there's no real answer to that, but because <clears throat> sometimes you want full value, but you just have to sing it both ways. You know, I'm gonna start singing in 22, <laughs> the soprano. <laughs> or <laughs> You know, you might want it clipped like that. I think it's actually more stylistic, <clears throat> especially when you have a fast tempo. We'll get to this later on to clip the last note. Um, all right, so, you know, let's just go for a moment to 33. Now, obviously the first note of the each entrance is an octave higher than the second. So it'll stand out, of course. But the question is, do you want it legato? Or you want it like, like poco marcato, or, or not even poco marcato. Maybe it's legato, but each of the hairs has an, a slight accent. Let's let's call it a tenuto, a horizontal line. So, so you have a combination of legato and poco marcato side by side, side by side. It's sort of like, again, a Messiah handles Messiah. Um, yeah, let me just, I, I can't remember, but there are certain, well, it's all throughout Bach and Tadas where, you know, one phrase can have even three different markings, staccato, legato, and, you know, poco marcato or marcato. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, so this is the, these are the kind of markings, you, things you have to work out when you sing the notes. <clears throat> first of all, you should know, you should learn every part. I mean, there's no doubt. Because in rehearsal, you're gonna have a bass raise his hand and ask you to sing an F sharp going to a B flat in measure 33. Right? <laughs> an F sharp going to a B flat, that's hard. But it's not hard. Well, here's, here's um, a thought. When I taught sight singing, I always had them, uh, my students write in the Roman numerals um, of, of the chords. But I think of the F sharp as the third of, the, of a D chord and the B flat a third of a, of a G chord. It's not really a G chord there, but if you can imagine, in most cases it would be a B flat a third of a G chord. So somehow going from a third of a chord to a third of another chord, uh, you know, makes it easier. 
I'm not being totally clear, but my main point is learn the part <laughs> and then learn the notes because just because you can't stand in front of a choir without knowing how each line goes and then figure out you know the dynamics and the shape and the phrasing and all these markings that you want. Okay, let's go on because I can spend forever on this. Um, now it, it's, it's da capo, go all the way to um, the second movement, scroll way down, fast, 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 second movement. Karina, okay, yeah, no, that's the, uh, that's number seven, number five, number four, number three, okay, oh, go back, go back, okay, here we are, almost, um, okay, we just ended, it's da capo, so, um, I still feel the need, I'll go back a little bit so we can see the ending of movement one. Even though it's da capo, well, let me, let me start again. Since it's da capo, you know, the, the fine is halfway through this movement, right, before the B section, and we're, that we're really retards. You have to mark retard in the score. But even here, I, I, I do a, a slight retard, so I'm going to start from 94. 94. Da, 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 dun, 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 dun. I might even subdivide the fourth beat because there are 16th notes in the orchestra. So da, 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 three and four and one off. One off. Da, 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 da. Okay, so anyway, that's fine, it ended. What do you do? This is. Um, a recitative secco, which means it, you can't really tell from, from what you're looking at, but it's just continuo. It's not accompagnato, which would be like strings sustaining the notes, like in Comfort Ye, but in Handel's Messiah. So the question is, do you, uh, do you uh, conduct this? No. Okay, I'm telling you flat out. I mean, if you want to disagree with me, fine. But um, <laughs> there's not one professional continuo player you know, the harpsichordist or the portative organist or with a cellist who would want you to conduct a recitative secco. It's not, it's not um, in, in uh, metronomic time, right? But you want to start it or not. I prefer to start it. I prefer to keep the, uh, the, the flow the way I want it, not the way the continual player wants it. I once got into a little, uh, not an argument, but you know, a continual player should, shouldn't, be, um, you know, being, uh, being, shouldn't sound annoyed with a conductor who doesn't want him to start, even though I think, you know, 95% of the time, at least, a, a really good continual player will know exactly when to start dramatically, but I like to control it. So it, the, the movement finishes, and then I go one, and I, that's it. I just bring them in and I cut out. And in my score, I put a big bracket, a closed bracket, like an open bracket or an arrow and then a closed bracket, like get out of there, you know? Um, but this is this, uh, the lead into number three presents an interesting dilemma and challenge for the composer, com for composer, for the, co for the conductor, I mean. So can you go to the end of the second movement? By the way, I have no intention of getting through all 62 movements tonight, it's impossible, but you'll get the idea. The que so, I mean, if you, I mean, the chorus has, to, the strings have to be brought in. The orchestra has to be brought in at measure 18, obviously. How do, how do you set the tempo if you've been laying low for measure after measure after measure, like this? Here's Jesus. You see that? Ven right? So you're not doing anything, but you're raising your hand in an unthreatening way, in sort of a neutral position. And you, you as a conductor should, should go three. Dun, 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 dun. In other words, setting the tempo for the evangelist. Um, now you might say, well, okay, there's an alternative to that, and, which happens at times, which is maybe you don't want, I mean, Jesus is saying here, you know, who do you seek? And then they answered, Jesus of Nazareth, the antwortaten, you know, and then they answered, Jesus, we seek Jesus of Nazareth. So the alternative to doing what I just did, the 
if you and or the soloist want that those five notes before the downbeat to be a little slower and you agree with the soloist you don't have to agree but if you both agree then you don't give a firm allegro third beat prep see in fort you, you just go see on board ta, 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 and you make a nice gravitational use of gravity on the pickup so it, so the pickup is not in tempo but you can still set the tempo with gravity like this you can i mean it, the, really the tempo isn't established clearly until measure 18 but really if you just if you're consistent with your use of gravity so that you're imitating a ball going up in the air and coming down faster and you're consistent with that then you can get a great togetherness on the tempo it's really a quite a remarkable um tool to use <clears throat> and yes uh, singers should watch you and uh you know at situations like that and it should be worked out obviously it should be worked out ahead of time what's going to happen okay it's a it's an angry crowd so do you want piano piano legato andante or do you want i want him i want you know we want to get him um or something in between <laughs> so so i think um the words right before this are um pretty uh dramatic jesus went with his disciples over the brook Hebron, da, 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 uh, together with the disciples therefore judas having received um, a band a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees cometh thither with lanterns, torches, and with weapons. So you don't want this to be legato or soft. So in the score, um, you can put a real accent on ye and a staccato on zoom. Ye zoom. Ye zoom. And then to be consistent, even though the third J E is on the and of one as opposed to on a beat it comes in on the and you want to accent it so it's one yezum three yezum yezum from not not yezum 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 from not even though this is a zoom meeting that wasn't a zoom meeting back then they didn't have internet so it's yezum for be consistent that was, that's a good one i gotta write that down um <clears throat> from nazareth and again, the tendency might be to go Nazareth, Nazareth, instead of Nazareth. There's nothing wrong. In fact, it's kind of um, exciting to have coming away in volume. Yezum from Nazareth, Yezum from Nazareth. And then at the end of this, go to the next page, would you? You can do something a little different at the last, the last, the last one, right before the recitative. Instead of I'll start from the last two measures, the top of the page. No, I wouldn't do that. I'd go. I wouldn't do subtlety there. I wouldn't come away to the weakest of the three syllables, which is ETH. The last time, it's an angry mob. No subtlety, just anger. And, you know viciousness but then you have to keep conducting you can't stop conducting um until wait let me just look at my score here oh yeah oh well, no you you can't see it so i'm looking at the orchestral score and the string play the orchestra uh, that quarter note you see at number four is um is it then the orchestra rests and the continuo takes over so Nazareth one off. Con keep conducting Nazareth one off. Cut them off because 
it's a transition and it doesn't necessarily have to be metronomic. Nazareth, one off. No, Nazareth, one off. See what I'm doing? I'm stretching the downbeat a little bit. I'm not saying it has to be that way, but that's one, that's one means of expression that um, is important not to be, you know, metronomic. And then, um, yeah. And you don't conduct this whole recitative. Let's look at the chorales now. The first chorale, number seven. Um, hold on one second. Okay. Um, I don't think the. I mean, it's modern scholarship dictates that um, you know the the fermatas weren't really necessarily taken verbatim. So it's just a collection point. So you. So as a conductor, you have to decide both which of the fermata should, can be held, because sometimes you want to have a fermata held as a fermata, which one, sh which note under fermata should be connected to the next one without breaths and which notes under fermata should have a breath after it before you um, come in with the pickup to the next measure. You have to, and you have to know the nature of the, um, the text. You have to know the text. Okay, these are reflect the reflective observers of the action. And they're saying, oh, wondrous love, whose depths no heart has sounded, that brought thee here by sin and grief surrounded. So I hear mezzo forte here. Uh, that's just what I hear. It doesn't have to be. Somebody else might want to do it uh, forte or mezzo piano. But um, at the very end, Look what I do at the very end. I'm going to sing the uh, second half of this, which is made, pick up to measure seven. Because listen, here's the text. There we live. Um, the pleasures of this world enjoying. And the last two measures, and thou art dying. So I'm going to sing the pick up to seven. No breath. A decrescendo. I have a decrescendo up the octave from the soprano D E N to the und. And it's pianissimo at that point, except to make it even more beautiful and significant. You don't want to just stay pianissimo, and you must die. And then the mouth is open for the ah of lie. The first half of the diphthong is ah. So you're going from must, must, lie. Your lips fly open and it's like a, a groaning. You can actually sort of groan a little bit and not make a beautiful pure ah sound. Instead of like musla, make it musla, like whining, you know, and yeah, like being that linking up with the words and the meaning. Um, and then I probably subdivide because I'm milking this for the tenors, for the tenors' sake. Okay, I, I subdivide it for the tenor's sake. And you tell everybody else, especially the sopranos, because they have a half note, that you're going to subdivide the fourth beat because the tenors have eighth notes. And I wouldn't change your mind. Like, if you're constantly rehearsing that you're subdividing, I wouldn't suddenly in performance not do it. That's important. So, I might even do this sometimes, very rarely, but sometimes I, instead of just cutting them off, I go like, but I'll tell them ahead of time, I'm going to do this. This, this is, this means sustain the end, sustain the end, like amen, amen, and then you have to cut them off. So it's, you're cutting, you're going to cut them off, they're expecting you to do that, and the end should be soft, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be louder than the vowel before it. It's like imitating a resonance in a church. Let's go on. So then the next recitative comes. You, oh, at this point, can anybody think of what you should really do at this point? I'm not gonna waste time. There's nobody here in the world who's gonna give me the right answer. So I'll tell you the right answer. At this point, you should wait for latecomers. 
<laughs> I'm serious. This is a good. This is a good spot. <laughs> Unless you told the ushers, don't let anybody in until part two of this. <laughs> um, okay. <clears throat> so here we are. You give the you give the downbeat, and they take off without you. Um, let me just uh, check something. It's unbelievable. It's we're almost like like four fifths done. I didn't expect to get too far, but the thing is, a lot of the concepts I'm telling you now are things that you can use throughout the whole piece and any piece. You know, are there any questions uh, uh, before we go on? And if not, I'll just go on. Um, I have a lot of scores. I own a lot, uh, like 20 or 25 sc vocal scores of this, but I, I never um, Xerox, you know, published music, but sometimes I'll order scores for people that they must purchase. And then I, I mark up my score and scan it and they have to either transfer markings into their score or just print out my, my markings. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's go to some of the choruses. <gasps> oh, here's an aria. Number 11 is an aria. Let's, let's do that. There we go. Now, here's something interesting. Um, <coughs> you know, like in, in uh, early Baroque, like in Monteverdi, uh, the continuo is more varied than it became in the late Baroque where, you know, with sacred music, you want a portative organ and cello. Uh, the question is, do you have a double bass also? Uh, it depends on certain things. But if you do have, I mean, in the, in the early Renaissance, you had like the fiorbo, whatever you call it, the bass lewd can be a part of a continuo. But um, the question is, should you have a double bass? Um, doing a recitatives with the uh, cello and portative organ. And as I said, it depends on various things. Uh, number one, how close the double bass player physically is to the cellist, um, how, how good he is at this. Some of them are just spectacular. I've worked with the Orchestra of St. Luke's a number of times, quite a number of times actually. Uh, uh, members of, and I, I hired the Orchestra of St. Luke's. They never hired me, but I hired them like without exaggeration, probably 21 or 22 times. I got Myron Lutsky, the cellist, and all these great, great, great players. Um, and they're, they're a team. So, But sometimes you want a certain softer sound and you don't have the double bass player. And sometimes you want the bassoon to, to be uh, there instead of the uh, cellist. This is something you can talk to your concert master or concert mistress about when you get together with them to talk about bowings. And that's a whole other subject. But we won't go into that now. But let's look at the um, the aria. Um, yeah, this spirit, it's quite simple. I mean, to me, it's moderate. So you just give the three one. There's not much you have to do except um, make sure that when the singer uh, comes in on measure ten, for example. Well, actually, uh, no. Let's take the first entrance. Oh, this is interesting. In this score that you're looking at, but not in my score, there's a piano at the beginning and then an editorial piano when the uh, alto comes in, in italics. So what does that mean? I mean, when you have a dynamic marking, it usually means there was something different before that. So that's strange. Uh, if, there, if there are no markings, like in most scores there are probably no markings, you'll want to have, make sure the, um, players play softer every time the singer comes in. You know, so maybe the opening can be mezzo forte and the, the singer comes in with the piano. Okay, that kind of thing. Let's go to some of the other choruses because there's some real drama and the need to mark certain things. Um, so let's go all the way to uh, number 17. Number 17. I mean, if you can go faster, that's even better because it's, I don't know if you can or not. We'll get there. Anybody have a good joke to tell me now? Okay. <laughs> Brian is laughing already. I haven't even told the joke. All right. <laughs> I, I know one joke only. <clears throat> okay. 
Okay. Well, the text tells you what to do here. You know, hey, aren't you? Are you not one of his disciples? Mr. Nist. Mr. Nist. It's a mock allegro. Probably that fox mocking. So, <clears throat> um, I mean, there's so many ways to interpret this. That's the beauty of it. There's so many ways, you know? But if it's allegro, you're conducted in four or two. Aha. Uh -huh. Let's say it's allegro and it's in four. So what's the fastest tempo you can conduct allegro in four without getting, it's getting ridiculous. It seems to me this is about the fastest you, you ever want to conduct allegro in. So that'll be But I don't hear it like that. I hear it So I'm not a scholar, a musicologist. And I don't think uh, C, the letter C, necessarily means that you have to feel it in four. I think it's it's a duple, you know, because it's totally obvious to me this should be in 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 uh, in two, not not conducted in four. Now this comes after um, a recitative. Let's go up for a moment. Back, look at the recitative. Leads right into it. See. Uh, so the the. Um, the, the meaning is now Anna sent him bound to the high priest Caiaphas. Simon Peter stood and warmed himself, then said they to him, A Simon Petros plan on Bahamans each. The Sprachen sing dum dum da da dum da. I hear those last five notes of the recitative as being in the tempo of the chorus, as opposed to. But I can see that as an alternative. I can. But it, for the first way, which is my preference, you want to start conducting. So, Simon Petrus stund und war Right there. Two and three. And so you do the second beat as the prep. However, um, I also feel that it should be very soft for dramatic effect. Well, I'm, I'm conducting a four. Should be conducting a two. But towards the end, look, go to the end, Karina, please. This is really a fabulous, fabulously dramatic moment. So let's say we're on, okay, measure 18. Suddenly it gets very loud, very suddenly, um, midway through this, the next to the last measure. And then the last note is obviously staccato. Well, he has two staccatos there. Maybe he put them in. I don't think so. No, I'm, maybe I'm seeing things. I'm seeing dots under the G sharps, Karina, and not under the other alto tenor bass. So who knows what that is? Oh, I see staccatos. I see staccatos, um, you know, in the previous measure. I don't know. Is it editorial? I don't know. It doesn't matter. Um, you know, you know, I, you all know I work with composers a lot. And I've had, without exaggeration, close to 600 composers come to my rehearsals towards the end like the next to the last rehearsal, then the dress rehearsal, including Pulitzer Prize winning composers, you know, Corigliano and John Harbison and, you know, all the other. And the way I interpret, they, they like it. It might not be exactly what they want, but they put in the music or maybe they left out stuff. It's up to you to interpret without going too far astray. And certainly if the composer doesn't want you to do it, you don't do it. But, da -da -dum -dum -da -dum. Okay, and then, um, you conduct the downbeat. And even though there are multiple uh, singers here, don't interfere. They can do it on their own, for sure. So it's 746. I can go on, but um, are there any questions about this or things in general? If not. Our part, one of our participants, Celeste, had a question. Yeah. About something that she had heard in some interpretations and recordings. 
If you would like to ask that question, you can unmute yourself. And who is that? Celeste. Oh, Celeste, yes. Uh, hi, Harold. Hi, Celeste. Um, yes. Yeah, I was listening to um, in a, a various recordings just to get an idea because I was sort of cramming to get the most out of this, of course. And um, I heard one of the recordings that you mentioned, well, something that got softer with the hair uh, that was absolutely, you know, stunning um, how, how that went. But I also noticed that um, in various places, and I'll pick one in particular, it's a measure. Which movement? Um, the first movement. Yeah. I'm working with a small with no measure numbers, so <laughs> this is hard. Uh, yeah. Measure 33. Measure what? 33. 33. Yeah. Um, yeah. Those entrances, and I um, heard it done in a similar way. I, I don't have specifics because I'm coming to this work late in life, so to speak. Um, but these kinds of entrances, the um, conductor had the soloist sometimes coming in, like in this particular place, from 33 up until 37. Yeah. And then, because it's a light texture with the orchestration, and um, seemed to work in them where the, where the orchestration got thicker, you know, not no staccato and lighter sound, the entire chorus came in on um, the, the third beat. So and, we, it was, and, it, and it was, as, um, it automatically changed, it was a small chorus, you know, it was nicely balanced, but it automatically made a dynamic change without having to indicate a dynamic change. I got the feeling you were making, you know, dynamics in that particular place. And so my question was, yeah. would you be a similar thing where, um, where there's a thinner texture of orchestration and uh, entrances coming in like they did here, and then where things get thicker to just have the rest of the chorus um, join in? No, I wouldn't do that. And I think I, I think I heard the same recording as you, and I was I was startled by that. And, <laughs> I mean, look, one can do anything, you know. I mean, especially with Bach. I mean, Bach, you know, ha has been turned into jazz, and you know, played on accordion and everything. Oh yeah, I, but but not going that far. Oh, but, not I, I, but you know, I'm, I'm not talking about a cast of thousands. I think we may be thinking of the same thing, where the addition. Of just the rest of the chorus automatically makes the dynamic change, if you know what I mean. It creates. Of course, I know what you mean. Of course, but it, it's less a, di a dynamic change because when, if you have a chorus of sixteen or twenty, and right, they, they suddenly come in after soloists, but they come in at the same dynamic level uh, mentally as the soloist. It will be louder, but it will still sound like the soloist was piano, let's say, and the chorus is piano. So it's not like you're going to notice a huge dynamic change. You'll just notice a different, you know, size group. But in this particular piece, in the last movement, he has, um, if I'm not mistaken, coro ripieno. And in the very, very last movement, which we're not, we're not going to get to, he right. mentioned that the B section could be for a quartet. Right. So because he marks it there and no place else, I think it's t playing around too much. Uh, uh -huh. By doing it there, but that's just one person's opinion. No, I, I'm, that's why I just when I'm throwing it out to you because I'm I'm hearing by comparison and just noticing it and just wanting to know what your what your astute opinion is. In, and if I could follow it up with a continual question, I would. I don't want to usurp all your time. No, go ahead. Uh, it could be the, a similar situation where um, I thought it was kind of creative, where. Um, the continuo was not always the same. In other words, um, this recording had a, a, a lutenist. Um, I forget the, um, again, mm -hmm. all the different um, uh, instrumentalists that were comprising the continuo. But he, he, the continuo itself would um, change according to um, maybe the voice, like say the, uh, if, if it's an aria for the soprano or one for the bass, that it wasn't always the same continuo 
set of instruments playing. No, I, I agree. I, I even mentioned that. I don't, I don't know if, <clears throat> if you heard that, that, you know, you can have a double bass doubling the cello or not, and you can have a bassoon replacing the cello. So I agree with that for sure. And I usually rely on the concert master um, to suggest things, you know, uh, but that's, that's a definite yes there. Throughout the, the same piece though? Throughout, oh, throughout one movement? I mean, in one no. movement, change continuo? Like a well, different- I think I, I, may, I might not have remembered properly, but there are, as you saw, uh, sometimes the, um, where the retrogatives are, are going back and forth, sometimes between frequently, you know, two voices. Um, it wasn't always the same. Yeah, I mean, I, I can see that. In fact, in the St. Uh, Passion, in the St. Matthew Passion, every single time Jesus sings, you have the strings. Even in a recitative secco, just harpsichord or, 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 you know, organ and cello, let's say, and, you know, the evangelist and then Petrus, and then suddenly Jesus comes in with a musical halo yes. all the time. That's what it represents. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I can see that. And even, even in other places I can see, you know, again, I'm not an expert on that, but I, I can see altering it. I just, uh, maybe in a long recitative with different characters, but I'm not so sure in, in, in one section of one movement of a piece, whether it should be changed. I don't think oh, so. Oh, I, I didn't mean it that way, you know. Um, yeah, I agree with uh, you. Um, not where that's the only changing part you know, of something that's more consistent and organically one thing, you know. Right, uh, right, exactly. Now, do, uh, uh, expanding on that, in, I believe also in the St. Matthew and many other pieces in the Baroque, you have an organ and a harpsichord. That's like what I heard in this recording too, I think. And, and some, it was very interesting. Yeah, sometimes they play together and sometimes the harpsichord takes over, even though in sacred music, supposedly it's, you should, the, the, the default, default is the organ. But um, right. I think Bach, uh, you know, calls for um, harpsichord specifically. I'm sure other composers do in certain places. Yeah, good questions. Because I could hear um, like a keyboard playing a chord, the lutenist playing an arpeggiation of it, or, um, you know, <clears throat> right. you know sort of riffing, like the rhythm section of a jazz, you know, group, you know, <laughs> which was, you know, they're all, uh, tightly knit, but they're not doing exactly the same, you know, thing. Which is what the composers wanted, sure. The composers didn't write out, didn't write out the figured bass. They just, you know, the realization of the bass, they just put the numbers. Right, right. Good. Any other questions? I remember doing this in Alice Tully Hall, I think it was 1981. And I didn't want to tape it because it was so expensive. The whole production was so expensive. I mean, back then it was like, I don't know, the whole thing cost me $22,000, but now it'd be like 60,000. But I, somebody gave me money, $600, so I could have it taped as an archive, you know, recording. After the performance, the head stagehand or manager comes to me and says, oh, sorry, he forgot to push the button to start it when he went out for dinner. So he didn't record it. <laughs> and, and the same thing happened twice to my friend, George Rothman, who conducted. Con <laughs> oh, can you believe it? The anyway. silent scream. <laughs> it happened to me several times. I wasn't happy. <clears throat> Allah, it happened to you also? Several times it happened to me, yeah. Uh, where? Uh, with premiere of my composition, uh, Immersion says with St. Luke's, who commissioned it. Oh my God. They didn't record it. And they, after that, did second performance, which was not so great. And uh, I didn't have good experience, sorry. Although they commissioned peace, so which is nice. <laughs> right. <Yeah. clears throat> yes, Don. Uh, I, I understand that uh, Shaw used the technique with his choirs where they had a lot of melisma uh, of, of putting in uh, like a consonant, like da, uh, in some of the choir to keep it uh, together and articulate. How do you feel about that? Very, very strongly in favor of that. I've, I've used that technique myself. Not here, uh, 
because that's I mean it's too slow like <laughs> but some some pieces I've done where the court the 16th note was da 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 on ah uh, not everybody can do it so you have half the choir going da 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 like da 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 and half the choir going ah uh, 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 and it sounds just articulated instead of da 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 it comes out like in between it's a wonderful technique yeah. And I don't know, you know, much more about it than what I just said, but people, disciples of his, I'm sure have other tricks like that. Yeah, I should do a whole session on tricks, you know, like mm -hmm. vocal tricks to, to uh, pull things off that are hard. Pearls of wisdom. What's that? Pearls of wisdom, not tricks. <laughs> And I can include something by George Pearl too, because <laughs> <laughs> George, I did the premiere piece by George Pearl. That was the year he won the Pulitzer and the MacArthur Genius Award, both in one year. <laughs> I think the MacArthur Genius Award pays three hundred thousand dollars, wow. and you don't apply. You just, and we got into a taxi together, going from the dress rehearsal to. Um, the Cooper Union, his wife and he were, and were walking and he said, let's get a taxi. I said, okay, it's like three blocks away. So we get in the taxi and, you know, here I am, the struggling musician and he gets out of the cab with his wife and walks away and I had, I had to pay the taxi driver. Okay, that's the same year he won the poster and the <laughs> Okay, this is on audio. Oh God, now I... <laughs> <laughs> Precious moments. <laughs> yeah, <really. laughs> so I think we've reached the end just about. Maybe time for one more question or comment. The final next week, next week we're doing the Verdi Requiem, I think, right? Yeah. The Verdi Requiem, which I've conducted twice. Once in Carnegie and once in Todi, Italy, in the main cathedral, where um, the, the bishop of the town is buried and also uh, what's the medieval uh, poet slash musician who's buried right there? I forget. Let me think. Um, it's in textbooks, like Grout. Anyway, that was a startling performance, and part of it is on YouTube. Somebody took a camera, you know, took a YouTube from the back. Brana, were you in that? Brana, did you sing in that, Brana? No. You mean, you mean Jacopone da Todi? Ah, thank you, Antonio. Absolutely. He's buried there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. Da Todi from the town. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he, he wrote the first, like, you know, pre-opera yeah. kind of music. So that was a great experience, um, except uh, there were a lot, all kinds of things that went wrong beforehand, but it turned out well. I had a full dress rehearsal and it ended a half an hour before the performance. And it was during the summer, I was soaking wet. <laughs> <laughs> so I went backstage and changed and came back on and <clears throat> anyway, anything else? Okay. Thank you all so much for joining us. We hope to see you next week. Tell your friends and colleagues we have more seats now that we don't have active participants. You know, we can have up to a hundred a hundred uh, viewers. So spread the word and uh, thank you so much, Harold. You're welcome. Goodbye, thank everybody. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Have a great week, everyone. Ciao.